A couple of years ago, Boris Johnson, the principal figure of Brexit, was known as Teflon Boris. Whatever the scandal or mistake, it didn't seem to affect him. The simple slogan of get Brexit done saw him gain a large majority. But two years later, and Boris's political star is a shadow of its former self. The Daily Telegraph, a major Brexit supporter, declared on its front page last week, the cult of Boris, the cult of Brexit, is over. Given an unprecedented cost of living crisis, the electorate are turning against Brexit. The percentage of Britons regretting Brexit has grown to a record level. Now there's no chance of a quick return to the European Union. Neither the UK or EU want it at the moment. But what about the next generation of voters and politicians? If things can change so quickly in the past two years, what about the next 20 years? Could the UK rejoin? The first reason why the UK could rejoin the EU is the generational divide on Brexit. The only age group who currently support Brexit are the over 65s. Amongst the young voters, 18 to 24, who were too young to vote in 2016, 79% are in favour of rejoining the EU. This compares to 40% of over 65s. I recently asked young voters in Oxford what they thought about Brexit and rejoining, and there was overwhelming support of the idea. Um, to be honest, I was always 50-50 about it, um, but in hindsight, I don't think it was a good idea. I preferred for us to uh, you know, be part of the EU. Just, to be honest, a free movement, you know, job prospectors, I was working in Germany now, it's a bit, you know, a bit more difficult for like to do stuff like that. And what would you like to happen in the next 10 or 20 years in your lifetime? Uh, peace, peace in the Ukraine war. <laughs> so we're all sort of, you know, not directly affected by that and back to the European Union. Definitely. Great. Hi. I mean, yeah, probably. I think that like following the split, it would cause quite a lot of issues to like rejoin. But I mean, I think it would have been better if we'd ever left. But. The widening gap over Brexit, it's partly due to some people changing their minds, but also it is mainly demographics. The oldest Brexit supporting voters are dying out, whilst younger, more pro-EU voters enter the electorate. All other things being equal, in 10 or 20 years, demographic changes will decisively shift the electorate to a pro-European majority. People voted for Brexit for a variety of reasons. It's not just about economics, but for many Brexit voters, especially in working class areas, there was a hope Brexit may improve living standards and public services, or at the very least, not make them any worse. Unfortunately, since 2016, and 2021 in particular, the UK economic situation has deteriorated with falling real wages and an unprecedented cost of living crisis, which has dented confidence in Brexit. Now, it is true that the economic situation is at least partly due to the external shocks of COVID and the Ukraine war and global inflation. European countries are also suffering inflation and a cost of living crisis. However, even accounting for these external shocks, it is hard to ignore the negative impact of Brexit on investment, economic growth and trade. The OBR estimate a net loss of 4% of GDP due to Brexit. The European Centre for Economic Reform estimate a higher 5% loss. Now, whilst other countries have also struggled, the UK is still one of the weakest performers in relative terms, especially with real wage growth, and has one of the worst forecasts for 2023. If we were living in a period of rapid economic growth, it would be easier to absorb the economic shock of Brexit. But we aren't, and in the minds of voters, the cost of living crisis will have a strong connection to Brexit. Third reason is the rehabilitation of the EU's image. When the UK were in the EU, it was a butt of many jokes, but British tabloids in particular loved to poke fun at EU rules and regulations and tended to blame the EU on many of our problems. Boris Johnson, by the way, was a leading protagonist. The infamous EU ban on bendy bananas was symbolic of how Britain's problems could be blamed on the EU. However, when you are no longer in the EU, no longer such an easy scapegoat. A survey from World Values Survey asked the electorate about trust in different institutions. Between 1990 and 2018, the UK Parliament was comfortably head of the EU. But since 2018, this has gone into reverse, with the EU gaining 39% confidence, and with UK Parliament and UK Government 
polling at less than 25%. The Ukraine war has put Brexit into context. It has shown that the ideals of European unity and democratic ideals is a major factor that binds the UK and Europe together. Another reason is that immigration will be different in 10, 20 years time. In the years leading up to 2016, net migration from Europe did grow to record levels, causing net migration of up to 300,000 a year plus. Combined with austerity in public services, many voters felt they were losing out as mass migration was blamed for driving up house prices and longer waiting lists on the NHS. However, in 10 or 20 years time, this may be all very different. Firstly, the UK has a declining birth rate. Although not one of the lowest in the Western world, it is still well below the replacement ratio of 2.1. It means that without migration, the UK will increasingly have an ageing population, a shrinking workforce, and in 10 years' time, a shrinking population. And this will place huge pressures on government spending and pension commitments. It could make immigration more attractive in the future. Secondly, when Eastern European countries joined the EU, there was a huge gap in wages between the East and West. There was a very powerful incentive for Eastern European workers to come to the UK for much higher wages. However, that wage gap is narrowing. Eastern European wages are catching up, and in 10 or 20 years' time, there may be a very limited wage differential between the UK and Eastern Europe. Who knows, perhaps it will be UK workers who want to go abroad to get higher wages in Europe. Also, perhaps an irony of Brexit is that reducing migration from the EU has caused non-EU migration to increase. So overall levels of migration are relatively unchanged. And the prominence of immigration in the media has fallen. Small boat crossings accepted, it's much less of a political issue. But the point is that in 10 or 20 years, or even shorter time, free movement of labour within the EU may be seen in a very different light, a much more positive light. Another reason is the reverse of globalisation. In the early 2000s, it seemed like globalisation was an unstoppable force. One argument for Brexit was that the UK didn't need its near trading partner Europe so much. But there was great opportunities around the world, such as more trade with Asia and Africa. However, geopolitical events of recent years have put a break on this trend to ever greater globalisation. There has been somewhat of a retreat and more focus on regional trading blocks, relying on Chinese investment to fund your nuclear power stations seems less appealing than it did in the past. These days, economists emphasise the importance of trade with your near neighbours. This is something known as gravity theory. It states that the optimal trade patterns tend to be countries in close geographical proximity, those countries who have similar living standards and cultural preferences. And so given the importance of the UK's trade with the European Union, it seems an unnecessary weight to impose the extra checks, customs and tariffs on trade with Europe. All governments generally want to increase economic growth, but generally it's hard to do, especially in recent years. However, in the future for the UK, there will be one very easy policy to improve UK growth, rejoin the single market and end all the obstacles to trade. At the moment, it's not on the table, but really it's only a matter of time. After the 2016 referendum, the narrow result, 52-48, and uncertainty of what Brexit was, caused many to consider a second referendum and basically overturn the result. And whilst there may have been a certain logic, if it had happened, it would have caused lingering resentment of a Brexit betrayal. But for better or worse, the UK did embrace a hard Brexit, the full deal, leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, ending free movement. Now, some may claim the full Brexit is only when you leave the ECHR or something like that. But I think for the majority of voters, they know we did Brexit. And by doing the full Brexit, it means the effects are quite visible. It was a clear choice. And it may be that the next generation decide they don't like it. But at least we gave it a full try. Now, earlier this year, I made a video saying that the euro is a major economic 
and political barrier to the UK ever rejoining the EU. I still believe this to be the case. However, although the EU do have a written requirement that new countries pledge to join the Euro, will the EU actually want to enforce this? As some commentators pointed out, countries like Poland made a commitment to join the Euro, but wisely seem to have no intention of carrying it out. It is not inconceivable that the EU may decide compulsory EU membership is no longer a requirement of rejoining. That would certainly make it easier, though perhaps uh, wishful thinking. Will the UK rejoin the EU? Well, we honestly don't know. A lot can happen in five or ten years' time. But I do believe that the long-term pressures will push the UK back to closer integration with the EU. The current trade friction between the UK and EU make no sense, and surely over time business will put pressure on the government to change. A really key factor is the age profile of voters. Over time Brexit will have diminishing support, and the next generation of voters and politicians are likely to have very different attitudes. And if that attitude does change, then I think Europe's attitude to letting the UK back in will also change. It's interesting what this uh, French uh, chap I met in the street said about this. In well, your lifetime? Yeah, yeah, surely. But I think it will be like a long process, even if like the public opinion is beginning to shift. Um, because, well, I think the Europeans need guarantees and the UK too for the people and for the economic stability. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. But I don't think it will be like just tomorrow. Yeah. It is certainly not a, a given the UK will join the EU. It may be that we end up being closer, but still outside, something like a Norway or Switzerland. One thing is clear, for the UK to rejoin, it would not be done on a very narrow majority, like say 52-48. It would probably require a sustained supermajority with a consistent 55-60% plus support for rejoining the EU. The Brexit referendum was run on a simple majority uh, outcome. But in other countries, another way of making long-term drastic constitutional changes is to require a supermajority of, say, 55 or 60 percent. If you're interested in more of the economic costs of Brexit, this video goes into much more detail about the impact on trade, growth and public services. Thanks for watching. Give it a thumbs up. Thanks. Bye.